Step 1. Attach our tying thread at the rear of the hook. The underbody on this fly is spun deer hair and they are going to use that smooth hook to our advantage. Step 2. For the overbody, we're going to use a piece of furry foam about the width of the hook shank and with one end trimmed to a point much like a picket fence. We'll tie that in place by the point right at the base of the hook, right before it falls off into the bend. Step 3. For the underbody, we're going to use some dyed deer hair. The color should approximate the natural underbellies of the nymphs. We're going to remove all the fur and short fibers so when we spin this, it'll be easier. I'm going to trim away the tips so you have a nice, short, manageable stack of deer hair. Take the tying thread, go around it once, twice, pull tight on the third, let go and let it spin and completely encompass the hook shank. I'm going to take a hair packer and push the deer hair backward into position. Support the fly from the back so you don't shove everything over the bend of the hook. Step 4. I'm going to take another clump of deer hair and trim it from the hide. About the diameter of a pencil or a pipe cleaner is fine. Grip the hair by the tips, strip away the short fibers and under fur. This helps the hair spin better. I'm going to trim off the tips. Once again, we're working with a small, short, manageable clump of deer hair. Go around once, twice, pull, and then let that hair spin and rotate around the hook shank. I'm going to free some trapped fibers. Then we're going to take our hair packer and force that deer hair backward. Can you use your thumb and forefinger for that? You can, but you can stab yourself. Step 5. I'm going to take a third application of deer hair and do the same, repeat the same steps. Remove the underfur, the short fibers, trim away the tips to once again make a nice, short, manageable stack. By pre-trimming like this, we're saving ourselves time when we do the final trimming. Around once, twice, pull, and allow that hair to rotate and spin around and then work the thread through the fibers to bind it in place and pack it tightly. The tighter you pack the deer hair, the more buoyant the fly will become. Step six. I'm going to take one final application Prepare it. Again, the removal of these short fibers and under fur helps the hair spin and rotate. A small, fine comb will work good too. And then once, twice, third time, we just let that thread tension roll the material around the hook shank then bind it into position and pack it tightly. How can you poke yourself if you don't use that? Well, your thumb and forefinger can slip and stab yourself right on the hook point. I see. It's painful. We'll just position that. Step seven. We're now going to trim the hair while it's still in the vise. For some, this might seem a bit adventurous, but as long as you keep your cuts small and manageable and keep a close eye on what actually goes into the jaws of the scissors, you should be quite safe. I'm going to trim the, the deer hair flush top and bottom. Step 8. We've now rotated the fly so we can have good access to the bottom. You notice that the bobbin is now swung out of the way behind the fly, taking it out of harm's way. 
We want to trim this as flush as we can along the bottom so we don't impede the hooking ability of the fly. Step 9. Now to trim the sides. We're going to trim them in a round spider-like shape as we're trying to imitate the natural sprawling nymphs this fly is designed to imitate. So this is the abdomen part of the uh, fly, yeah. is it? Yeah. It's a variation of a popular pattern called the gomphus. Step 10. I'm just going to repeat this far side as well. And you notice by the way we've rotated the vise here, we have good access to what we want to cut and trim, and the thread is on the back side out of harm's way. Be a bad time to have to start over. Yeah. Again, keep the cuts short and neat. Step 11. Now we're just going to take that furry foam strip, pull it over the top, and using our thumb and forefinger, massage it down the sides of the fly. Trim away the excess. Make sure it's in there good and tight. Again, you can position it, preen away those excess fibers. Step 12. For the legs, we're going to take about six to eight fibers from a hen pheasant feather and trim them right away from the stem. We're going to tie the ones in place on the far side of the hook first and position the fibers so the natural curvature flows down the fly. Tie them in place with a couple of firm wraps and then reposition the fibers so that the tips extend backwards even with the rear of the body. Trim away the excess. Step 13. For the near legs, we're going to use exactly the same number of hen fibers. Why do you like using hen fibers for this? They're soft and supple, and I just really like the model look that they create, more so than, say, uh, cock pheasant fibers, which tend to be not nearly as modeled. Step 14. So there's a bit of a tricky process here to tie these fibers in so that they don't flare, and then at the same time they still hold tight against the body. Yeah, I'm actually using tighter wraps up near the eye and looser controlling wraps as I sweep the fibers backwards. Step 15. For the head, we're going to flare deer hair this time as opposed to spinning it. The preparation process is the same. Remove the under fur and trim away the tips. Again, this helps the final trimming process. With the hair prepared, I'm just going to stab it all around the hook shank from the hook eye. Hold the hair in place and use thread tension to flare the hair. Notice it doesn't spin. I'm doing this because we spent all the time positioning the legs. We don't want the spinning motion of the hair to knock them out of place. And to save ourselves from being stabbed accidentally, we use the hair packer. Step 16. We've got a little more room here, so we're going to take a slimmer clump of deer hair, about the size of a matchstick, and prepare it once again. I noticed that we're going through a lot of steps with the deer hair. Is it better to do it in small clumps as opposed to big clumps? Yeah, with many materials, I prefer to put them on in small um, applications rather than one large, uncontrolled application. It's far easier to get the materials on the hook and apply them with the correct thread tension to hold them in place. Once again, we're going to pack the fibers to 
save our thumb and forefinger from the hook point. And then sweep the fibers back out of the way and build up a neat head to complete the fly. Step 17. Take our whip finisher, and using our thumb and forefinger, sweep the fibers back out of the way to expose the head and accurately place the whip finish at the front of the fly. Step 18. With the thread removed, it's now time to trim the head. I've broken the fly into four sections, top, bottom, and sides. And using careful trims of the scissor, I'm trimming away individual deer hair fibers. What we don't want to do here is accidentally trim the legs. We spent all that time getting them into position. Typically when I trim this fly, I like to do so on the top and bottom first, and then trim the sides to shape, which in the case of the sprawling nymph, we want to create a triangular head. Is this a, a buoyant fly like the other dragons? I notice you're using a lot of deer hair here, and it usually indicates a buoyant fly. Yes, it is. Um, these sprawling nymphs like to crawl over the bottom. They're ambush feeders. They're not nearly as uh, aggressive in their feeding habits as the larger, more hourglass-shaped darner nymphs, the ones we see climbing around the weeds. So we have to keep our retrieves slow and natural, so we need flies that are buoyant in nature and won't hang up. You can spend what, what seems like hours trimming deer hair flies. Again, these are scruffy looking nymphs. They have lots of little fibers all over their body that they use to trap debris to help camouflage themselves. So you don't have to be super picky when it comes to trimming them. In fact, the scruffier the better. Just get the basic shape in there. Exactly. Make sure our legs are still in the right position. Step 19. And now we're going to take a permanent marker and color the top side of the fly. Most aquatic insects have dark backs and light bellies. Would it be wise to take a fly to the lake side and color it there once you've determined what the actual colors of these insects are? Yes, it's actually a very good tactic. Just have a sort of base set of flies in, in one standard color and take a selection of markers with you to mix and match to whatever you find in the water. A completed furry foam dragon. Great scruffy looking pattern that we can creep and crawl over the bottom to simulate the plodding sprawler nymphs found in many productive lakes. 